On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, are we heading for Supply Chain Crisis 2.0? I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So a lot of issues are going on, particularly focused on the West Coast of the United States. Uh, over the past couple of days, a couple of allegations about lockouts, strikes, slowdowns are permeating through the West Coast labor negotiation. Understand, since the end of June last year, the ILWU, the International Longshore uh, Warehouse Union, and the PMA, the Pacific Maritime Association, uh, who represents the 29 ports along the U.S. West Coast, have been in a labor negotiation because their contract has expired. Now, normally those discussions start long before the contract expired. These discussions started in May of last year, but they have not been resolved. And we're going into over a year of negotiations, over a year since there's been no contract in place. What we're hearing now, and I hear this from both sides, people from the Pacific Maritime Association and the ILWU are very talkative about this issue, not in public and not on the record, but they will talk to me about it, are saying that basically everything was going fine in the labor negotiations until recently, and now it is busted. Basically, the issue that has caused the breakdown in the negotiation is the fact that the Pacific Maritime Association, which is made up of the ocean shipping terminals, the ocean shipping carriers, are refusing to agree to any pay wages to the uh, ILWU for a period of three years, basically freezing their wages where they are in place. Understand, they've talked about healthcare issues, they've talked about sick days, they've talked about automation, they've talked about all these other issues. This is the last one, and this is the one that has hit. Now, there are a lot of stories floating around out there about labor strikes, about you know the PMA saying this about the ILWU, about the ILWU saying this about the PMA. What I want to talk about in this video right now is what are the implications should something happen on the West Coast of the United States? Either a shutdown whereby the PMA locks out the workers and prevents them from coming to work, or the ILWU goes on strike or a slowdown, and what does that impact mean? Because understand, there's a variety of other issues that are at play here that are all linked together. I just did a Twitter thread on this, and what I want to do is kind of bring all these issues together and explain to you why this is important and why this may lead to a, a supply chain crisis akin to what we saw back in 2020-21. Now, I don't think it'll be anywhere near the scale of covid but it does have global implications, not just on the West Coast of the United States. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'd be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this and break this down story by story. So, number one, we have this story in G-Captain. Container shipping industry faces unprecedented unpre slump in long-term rates. And what we saw during the height of COVID was ocean freight rates went to a ridiculously high level. What do I mean by a ridiculously high level? Well, here's the Freightos Baltic Index. This measures the global container freight index. Now, this is a global composite. This is not the Trans-Pacific route uh, rates. This basically takes all the world rates and jams them together into an overall average, which is a good visualization. And you'll see how much they spiked. Pre-COVID, uh, you're running here around $1,300, $1,400. And then all of a sudden, we have COVID hit. We see this initial spike, and then it goes through the roof as we get into the fall of 2021 with rates right around uh, over $10,000, about ten, twelve thousand. dollars We were seeing rates on the Trans-Pacific route of about $25,000 for some spot rates. Now, that was extremely abnormal. Those are ones you don't typically see. But you see how the freight rates really sat up there and kind of leveled off. And then they fell off Mount Everest here, coming off in the fall of 2022. This is after the big surge of cargo came across for the holiday season. And now we see it plateau out. And we're sitting at about $1,380 right now. And understand, this has an implication. Uh, freight rates falling is great for the consumer. It's great for you because this means that you can buy goods coming across the ocean without a lot of transportation costs associated to it. Understand, during the height of COVID, when all that freight rate was going up through the roof, that cost was being paid by consumers. It's why you saw inflation take off. But one of, this thing, one of the issues that this has done is given the ocean shipper 
record profits. This comes from John McCowan's uh, most recently uh, most recent quarter report on container ship net income based on quarters back to 2016. And if you look back here to 2016, you'll see that the container ship companies were losing money. This is in US millions of dollars. So these are billions of dollars that they're losing right here. Only in 2017 do you see a little bit of an uptick here, but then back in 2018 loss, and then kind of breaking even here in the 2019. And then you hit 2020, and then the coffer dams just open up. I mean, it is a slot machine at Vegas paying off. And all of a sudden, you see these huge, massive record profits that are through the roof. Understand, when you look at 2021 or 2022, they made more profits in a single year, either 2021 or 2022, than all previous years combined for the last decade. So if you go back to the 2010s, I mean, the container shipping companies have made record profits, record profits. And even first quarter of 2023, we're seeing profits of over $12 billion being made. So while they're falling, and they're falling fast, understand this is a precipitous fall right now. We're seeing it fall. And so if you're the ocean shipping carriers, and by ocean shipping carriers, I'm talking about the big 10 ocean shipping carriers out there, everybody from Mediterranean Shipping Company down to Zim, are all have to be looking at this like, okay, we have some concerns here because as long as freight rates stay low, we're going to see our profits begin to disappear. And obviously they've invested heavily in new ship replacement programs. They've bought a lot of things. Some of the companies have begun to diversify into different areas of logistics. And obviously if you are an ocean shipping company, one of the things you have to be thinking about is how do I keep my profits high once again? I don't want a repeat of the 2010s. That takes us over then to the next story here, story number two. Fed's inflation fight faces a new challenge, a dry Panama Canal. So this is a story by Bloomberg. And let me just say, Bloomberg, you must have watched the uh, story we did over at uh, What's Going On With Shipping, because I just did a story on this where I talked about this. So I think Bloomberg is watching the channel. How about some credit there for you at Bloomberg? But anyway, this Fed inflation fight against a new challenge is a very important one, because one of the things we're seeing right now is the Panama Canal is falling in terms of its lake level. Now, a lot of people will sit there and go, well, wait, Sal, global warming, the, the oceans are rising. Oceans have nothing to do with the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal is above sea level and it's all fed by Gatun Lake and the lake levels are decreasing and that is causing a major problem. What do I mean? Well, we've seen the growth of vessels, uh, particularly container ships over the years. And one of the, the type of vessels that have been introduced is this type of vessel right here, the E, the Neo Panamax in 2014. So prior to 2016, you had limitations on the size of the Panama Canal. Go back up here to what's called Panamax. Panamax were the size of vessels that were limited by the old locks, the locks built back and opened in 1914, that limit the size. Well, a new lane of the Panama Canal opened in, in 2016, and now you have this new lane that can configure and hold these vessels. This lists the, the, the largest vessel is 12,500 TEU, but we've seen vessels almost up to 15,000 TEU, depending on the ships. And understand, a, a large part of the investment of the container companies with those new profits is in a ship replacement program and the type of vessel they're buying are these new neo panamax vessels and these new neo panamax vessels allow you to go through the panama canal bypass the west coast of the united states and go to ports in the east coast and the gulf coast that now have been dredged and can accommodate these vessels ports like houston charleston savannah uh, Jacksonville, New York, New Jersey, a slew of these ports now exist. The problem you have, bud, is back here on the Panama Canal, where the Gatun lake levels are dropping. In June, the lake level was recorded at 80.2 feet. Now, we're in an El Nino period here, where we're having less rainfall coming across the Isthmus of Panama, which means that water levels are falling. If you look at the projections here, water levels are scheduled to fall all the way into August. And this has reduced the draft of vessels. Neo Panamax vessels are typically at 50 foot draft. They're now down to 44 and a half foot with plans to cut that down to 44 feet. 
Now, if you look at this and you see this downward progression here, you may be sitting there going, well, Sal, is this normal or not? It's not. Because when you look at the yearly averages, here are the yearly levels. Starting in May, it should be kicking back up. And it's not. Matter of fact, it's going the opposite direction. And that impact means that we're going to see lower and lower levels. Now, that doesn't mean Neo Panamax vessels can't go through the Panama Canal. They can go through the Panama Canal. They just can't load to their full levels. And what mean, this means is cargo is going to be booted off these vessels. And if you want your cargo to go on these vessels, we've already seen that some shipping companies are requiring you, requiring you to pay a surcharge. Uh, Hapag Lloyd had just announced a $500 per box surcharge. Remember, this is what was happening on the west coast of the United States during the supply chain issue. When you wanted to get your container offloaded in LA and Long Beach, you had to pay that priority fee to get your container off. We're about to see that again with the Panama Canal. That takes us over to this story from Mike Schuller. West Coast ports losing 1 million TEUs per year to this eastward import shift. So one of the things that we saw come out of the first supply chain crisis, remember 109 vessels sitting off LA and Long Beach. Well, we didn't have a shipping problem. In other words, we weren't short of ships. We had plenty of ships. We had 109 ships off LA and Long Beach. The problem we had was moving the containers out of the terminals into the inland transportation system. Now, there's a lot of finger pointing about this. Uh, the PMA points at the terminals and sits there and says, hey, we need automation. We need the longshoremen to be more productive. The longshoremen sat there and pointed at the PMA and said, you refuse to pay for extra shifts. You refuse to pay this. So both sides are pointing the fingers at each other. Understand back in 2015, the Federal Maritime Commission did a study of this exact potential issue and found multiple reasons for it to happen. And basically both sides had issues at play here. The problem we're seeing, but is this shift is beginning to reverse. So this is a chart again from John McCowan's uh, monthly container report. And here you see the West Coast as a percentage of total inbound volume. Go back to 2017 and the West Coast is almost 58%. So almost 58% of all inbound containers were going into the West Coast. And what you see here is a gradual progression drop until you hit early 2020, where it drops below 50%, meaning more than half the containers were then going to the U.S. East Coast and the U.S. Gulf Coast. And those are two methods they do it. Number one, through the Panama Canal on those Neo Panamax ships or on board the ultra large container vessels. These are the huge container vessels, ships like Ever Given, uh, that go through the Suez Canal, 20 to 24,000 TEUs. They go to large terminals in Europe and then are transloaded onto smaller vessels to feed across the Atlantic to the East and Gulf Coast. But then you had COVID and all of a sudden you see it spike back up way above 50%, almost 55%. And that had to do with an influx of new container liners, regional container liners from the West Coast, jumping in on the traffic. But again, that begins to decrease, decrease until you hit late 2022, where it's below 44 uh, percent. And that really demonstrated that this shift has taken place. It also had to do with the fact that ocean shippers and uh, shippers themselves, the carriers, we're all moving cargo, diversifying where their cargo came in. They did not want to get log jam into L.A. and Long Beach, for example. There were issues in L.A. and Long Beach outside of the terminals. There were rail issues. There were drayage issues, warehousing issues. You name it. There were tons and tons of issues. Also note at the same time, not all ports on the West Coast were being very productive. If you look at the port of Oakland, for example, the port of Oakland saw a reduction in the number of overall containers coming in since 2019. Uh, that has to do with productivity in the Port of Oakland, also has to do with who wants to go in and out of the Port of Oakland. All those factors came in, but in 2022 into 2023, we see an uptick again back to the West Coast. Why? Because freight rates cratered. And now everyone wants to take advantage of those lower freight rates. So you're really in a situation where you either are paying really low freight rates to come into the West Coast, or you're paying a little bit more to go through the new lane of the Panama Canal, or via the Euro Europe route, but you're getting better reliability. And so people were paying a little bit more for that improved reliability. 
And that brings us to the issue that's percolating right now as tensions boil over in these West Coast labor talks. Mike Schuller did a story on this yesterday, posted it, but the heart of this story comes from a statement by the ILWU. And the ILWU posted this statement on June 2nd, and I'll have it up here for you. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But basically what they announce is a uh, uh, argument against what is happening in the labor negotiations. Uh, they're arguing that they're continuing to fight for respect and be treated with dignity by predominantly foreign-owned ocean carriers and terminal operators who re, uh, reap hundreds of billions of dollars in profits. And they're talking about, this is specifically talking about the ILWU members in Southern California, 12,000 of them, and talking about this. And they put out there the fact that during the height of the COVID crisis, they worked, continued to work, and at least 43 members of the ILWU died as a result of COVID. Now, I think they go a little heavy handed here in their statement. Uh, they talk about how they have done, uh, how they've worked U.S. cargo valiantly for decades. It, it's, it's a job. It's a great job. It, it's an important job. But I think the ILWU hits a resonance here. And I know a lot of people have issues regarding unions. And let me be clear. I understand your reservations toward unions. A lot of people have issues toward unions. But we should be clear here that maritime unions, particularly on the West Coast, did a lot to ensure workers got eight-hour workdays, 40-hour weeks, overtime pay, uh, ASHA, you name it. A lot of the things that we benefit in our daily workforce came from the maritime sector, particularly way back in the 1930s when we saw this. And the, the issue here, I would argue, is not union. It's not union at all. It's the fact that the Pacific Maritime Association, which represents the 29 U.S. ports, do not want to give a pay raise to the ILWU for the next three years. They want to lock it in place uh, because they're at this position. They, they did a masterful job to punt this down the road because if they were doing this labor negotiation during the height of the supply chain crisis, they would be in a terrible position to do this. But instead, they want to punt this down the road. And what this means is the PMA, and you should understand who the PMA is. The Pacific Maritime Association is cons you know, represent the 29 ports on the West Coast. This is their board of directors. So 11 member board of directors. And I just want to highlight where these 11 board of directors are from. So you have Evergreen Shipping, that is Taiwan. Ocean Network Express, that is Japan. CMA CGM, that is French. SSA Marine, those are terminals, that's U.S., uh, Hapag Lloyd, that is German. Matson, that is U.S. Marine Transport and Logistics, that's U.S. Pacific Crane Maintenance, that's U.S. Costco Shipping Lines North America, that is Chinese. That is Communist Chinese. Mediterranean Shipping Company, that is uh, Swiss. And Pasha Hawaii, that is uh, U.S. So you have U.S. representation on here, but the majority of the board members here represent foreign companies. Now, the CEO of, of the, uh, of the uh, organization, uh, James McKenna, who's president and CEO, he's a longtime maritime guy. He had been uh, chief operating officer for Horizon Lines. This was the domestic ocean carrier for Sealand that got carved out when Sealand was bought by Maersk. And the PMA is representing the terminals. If you want to know who, who's the full membership of the PMA, I'll have this list here. But that's the full membership of the PMA. They represent the ocean carriers, the terminals, the operators, you name it. And they're the ones that are controlling the wages for U.S. employees, which I, I, I have a bit of a problem with, I have to say, in this. Uh, granted that the Pacific Maritime Association uh, has a vested interest in the terminals and ports, but a large majority of these are not U.S.-owned companies, and yet they're determining the fate of U.S. Uh, wages for employees in ports from Seattle, Tacoma, all the way down to San Diego. And that is the issue that's resonating here right now. Add to it, we know that there's an issue with the alternative route around the Panama Canal, which is the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal has increased toll surcharges for vessels meaning that it's going to get more expensive to go through the Suez Canal. We've seen more traffic going through the Suez Canal. We just had a vessel that grounded in the Suez Canal the other day, and we're seeing that the pilots and the crews in the Suez Canal are being worked at a much higher rate. So what does this mean? What do all those stories mean combined together? 
if the West Coast has a issue, and I'm not saying what it is, you know, but if there is a slowdown on the West Coast, either created by the Pacific Maritime Association locking out crews, slowing down cargo coming through the West Coast, if the unions do a slowdown, if they do a strike, no matter what happens, if there's a slowdown on the West Coast, what this means is, okay, well, cargo could be diverted. It can go through the, the Panama Canal, but the Panama Canal is at low water levels. You're not going to be able to get your freight through there as readily as before. And if you are going to get your freight through the West Coast, you're going to pay for it. Same thing if you go through the Suez Canal. You're going to pay for it. At the same time, we're seeing ocean freight rates at the lowest level since prior to COVID. And this is having an impact on the profitability of the ocean carriers. So the ocean carriers have, I would argue here, nothing to lose by creating a problem on the West Coast of the United States. This is the fundamental issue here, that ocean carriers, most of them foreign-owned, foreign companies, have nothing to lose here by seeing labor disruptions in U.S. West Coast ports. And it's everything in their advantage to point the finger at the ILWU. And I'm not saying the ILWU is not without problems here. They all have problems here. But the benefit, the guys who benefit the most from this are going to be the ocean shipping carriers because what you're going to see is freight rates increase. And freight rates increasing means they're going to pass that on, not onto themselves, but onto the consumer, you which means all of a sudden transportation costs are going to go back up again, which means inflation, which means you're going to be paying more for goods. And that means their profitability is going to go back up again. You know, sailors drunk on money, nothing ever good comes from that. And what we're seeing right now is that playing out. We should be aware of this. And let's be clear, too, the, the PMA, the, uh, uh, the ocean shipping uh, uh, carriers, the World Shipping Council that represents the ocean shipping carriers don't like what's been happening with regards to regulation and increased regulation. You had the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. You've got new legislation that is being proposed right now. This is the worst move for the World Shipping Council and the ocean shipping firm. They should make a deal with the ILWU and make this go away as quick as they can. Because if this turns against them, it's going to be bad. Because right now you have more Americans than ever before cognizant of how dependent they are on ocean shipping. And if they see foreign shipping carriers manipulating the system to make more profitability at the expense of U.S. consumers, that's going to backfire. It's going to backfire badly. I'm telling you, it's not going to be good. And at the same time, both sides, the ILWU and the PMA, need to sit down and hammer out this agreement. They need an agreement. They need an agreement where both sides come to a firm decision on and end this uncertainty at the area. Because, again, with all those factors I just laid out, any disruption on the West Coast is going to, is going to be magnified. It's going to have not just an impact on the West Coast, not just on the United States. It's going to be global. And what we don't need is supply chain crisis 2.0. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. I got lots of comments right there. If you have a different perspective or insight you want to share with me, please let me know. Happy to talk to anybody about this. Happy to have people come on and talk about this. Let's go ahead and air these issues out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you support the page? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below. I'm sure the World Shipping Council and all the major shipping lines will make a huge, massive contribution to this channel right now, uh, along with the ILWU. I don't care. I'll take money from anybody. Uh, at the same time, you can become a patron of the page, a monthly or yearly subscriber to the page. Again, my goal here is not to have a perspective or viewpoint, but to lay out what ocean shipping means to you the consumer and the user of ocean shipping. Whether you believe it or not, you use ocean shipping on a daily basis. Every time you hit that button on Amazon, you are using the ocean shipping resources. Until the next video, this is Sal signing off.